Hi everyone, my name is Renee, Program Officer with EcoSchools Canada. On behalf of EcoSchools, thank you for viewing this webinar as part of the 2023 Eco Summit. I'm pleased to introduce Jade Harvey Barrel from the Outdoor Learning Store to present this webinar, Embrace the Outdoors, How to Integrate Outdoor Learning into Every Day. Jade is a physical geographer, environmental educator, outdoor instructor, and guide based in Revelstoke, BC. Jade has been designing and delivering environmental education programs for over 15 years across four continents and seven countries. She runs outreach and events for the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network and the Outdoor Learning Store alongside her own educational consultancy, Stoked on Science. In 2002, she hosted online Pro-D workshops that reached over 10,000 educators across Canada and the U.S. Helping to support educators to take their learning outside brings her the greatest joy, alongside showing people her rock collection, learning the languages of the Sinaiks and Tunaha First Nations, and the sounds of crunchy fall leaves or winter snow beneath her feet. Be sure to check out the accompanying worksheets for this webinar, which can be found linked in the description below and in the presentation schedule at ecoschools.ca slash ecosummit. We would also like to acknowledge that the Eco Summit has been made possible with support from Natural Resources Canada. We're glad to have you join us for this presentation, and now I will pass it over to Jade. Thank you so much, Renee. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope that this will um, be engaging and interesting for you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and we can get going there. So welcome to Embrace the Outdoors, how to integrate outdoor learning into the everyday. Um, hopefully there'll be some takeaways um, and something to sort of get you excited to take your learning outside. So um, that was a beautiful uh, introduction. Thank you, Renee. But I am Jade uh, Harvey Burrell. So I'm originally from the UK um, and I grew up in quite an urban environment. And I'm really very fortunate to have spent uh, my time uh, trying to spend as much time out in nature in various places. And I now live um, alongside the banks of the Columbia River uh, in what's colonially known as Revelstoke, um, British Columbia. Um, here I am with some grade 10 students. This is... Um, What's technically now referred to this water body is the Arrow Lakes Reservoir, and it was created when the Columbia River was dammed um, at Revelstoke and, and below a place called Castlegar. And so this is a um, an artificial reservoir that is flooded and we create hydroelectric power for uh, a lot of Canada and, and, and down into the US as well. Um, but it does make for some great uh, teachable landscape things. Uh, in this little town, they had a huge silver mining boom. Um, and before that, this area was utilised by um, several different Indigenous First Nations um, whose that whole area was flooded out. So we lost basically all of the archaeological record there, um, which, again, so we were teaching science, but we were teaching history, first people's principles. Um, and that brings me into um, my Indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, these are, you know, these are just a starting point. These are a starting point for relationship building. And I'm very, very grateful that um, as an uninvited guest, um, on Turtle Island that through my work with the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network where relationships have been built over the decades I'm so lucky that I have several Indigenous mentors um, who not only share their language with me their culture um, their perspectives um, their traditional ecological knowledge to some extent um, and they do this despite the fact and particularly as a British person um, of, of English ancestry that um, you know, people from my country and not just here, sadly, uh, in all over the world came and decimated their culture. They brought illness. They stole their children. They killed their children. They tried to destroy the indigenous way. And despite the fact that they would have never, for example, have reached Revelstoke, uh, which I'm circling here, um, without the support of Indigenous guides. And so how do you take the people that have led you to this bountiful, beautiful place and then destroy them and steal from them? And that's something that I am working on. Um, and as anybody who does outdoor learning or land-based learning, that, that is a huge thing. Um, we didn't learn about this in history. 
where I grew up, we don't learn about really the colonial powers of Britain. We don't talk about what we did in India or in Africa. We talk about winning world wars. That's that's the focus um, of our of our upbringing. And so a huge part of me, and I'm so grateful that the Truth and Reconciliation has produced calls to action and that the curriculum and, and knowledge base is changing here, but that we have to acknowledge the truth of what we did in order to reconcile and actually make steps forward. Um, and so, sorry for the sort of deep, dark intro, but that that is true. So this is a map that was created um, by the Autonomous next. And um, for them, this is the blood of life. So this is the Columbia River, this red um, wiggly line here. And, and it's red instead of blue, like on, on Western maps, because it is the blood of life. It was salmon, it was bull trout, it was um, beaver, it was um, the plants and bears that lived alongside the banks. It was shelter, um, it was travel. And so it's the blood of life. And um, the Sinaixt, there is the Autonomous Sinaixt and the Col uh, Colville Confederated Tribes Sinaixt. And they are um, not friends with each other. So the Sinaixt were declared extinct in 1965. I live on the traditional territory of the Sinaixt First Nations, and they were declared extinct in 1985, which funny or oh, sorry 1965 which is funny because it coincides with the fact that we created this columbia river treaty that was going to dam the river um destroy a lot of the lowland ecosystem um and make a lot of money building hydroelectric dams and it's interesting that those things coincided um <clears throat> the colvisor nikes were forced down into a reservation with 12 other first nations different and some of them who, who were not friends as well um to live on one one reservation um and a few people remained within the valley that managed to escape being forced out um so next in um in their language where i live is is this it's actually this really particular left-hand bend here it's called the big eddy there's a big swirling eddy of water um before the river uh, starts to turn south again and it's it's called skikin skikin and that means where the ridge lines meet the water. We have the Selkirk Mountains to the east and the Monishes to the west. And it's these two big oh, straight black ridge lines and then boom, down to the river. So it's really descriptive and it's a very beautiful and it's a very special place. Um, but for the Tanaha, and the Tanaha live um, out east here at the, the headwaters of the Columbia River. Um, and the Snipes and the Tanaha have shared sons and daughters over time. Um, and um, they shared the technology for the Sturgeon Nose Canoe, which is a really special um, bit of kit um, made out of cedar and birch <clears throat> trees. And the Tanaha call um, this river, instead of the Columbia River, they call it the Muskakas River, which is the Chickadee River. And they call Revelstoke the land of the Chickadee, the Muskakas. And so... Um, so next means bull trout. So this is a place of the bull trout, which I have declined uh, significantly since the dammy and the river. And um, chickadees, I see them outside of my window every day, whatever the season. And so these places are so special and so linked with this traditional knowledge of, of what makes them them. Uh, and so this is my expression of gratitude um, for the people who have cared and stewarded this land for thousands and thousands of years uh, and who've cared for it and um, utilised it in ways that, that if we had paid attention as as Western settlers, we would have uh, we would have had so much more. And we're so lucky that we're even allowed to engage with some of this knowledge. So I'm deeply grateful. And we also have the Okanagan silks um, that are very closely related and they share the Inselsheen language with the Sinaiks. And uh, they're more like grasslands um, people. They live down where it's a bit drier, just southwest of Revelstoke on the other side of these mountains. Um, but they traveled for trade and for um, hunting as well. And then um, to the west, directly west of us, we have the, the Shushwap, uh, Shikwetmik people the the lakes people who were prolific hunters and um had incredible knowledge of of the water systems and so these four first nations 
who you know have overlapped over time and 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 different geographical time scales um i i send my gratitude um for caring for this place and for sharing it with me when we go outside for learning like this this is a trip i took with a bunch of um 13 to 16 year olds um this is mount begbie it's a famous mountain um that's its colonial name the the traditional name has been lost it's in the monashi mountains you can see it from most of revelstoke you actually can't see the peak in this picture unfortunately it's just hiding up here um, but to get to this point is an 18 kilometer hard slog uphill and then actually to, to summit which we did you have to cross the ever shrinking sadly Be Begbie glacier up here and if you follow my pointer you cross the glacier and you actually gain this ledge which is only about a meter and a half wide and you have to walk this ledge all the way to the edge and then um it's like a class four scramble to the top and so we did this over a few days and i was there as part of the um this was like an intro to mountaineering and i was there teaching leave no trace principles and and field sketching um and you know just outdoor skills but this is this doesn't this you know this is amazing and and learning survival skills and, and learning sort of recreational um success is is amazing and if you do have access to landscapes and and pure wilderness wonderful and go out and enjoy it but it doesn't have to be this outdoor learning can be in a concrete schoolyard it can be finding cracks um of weathering and small pieces of green it can be interacting with uh the materials around you and what shapes do you see in the man-made world we live in um but just being outside so this is all very well and good. And I live in British Columbia. So a lot of my pictures are of big landscapes, but it doesn't have to be this. Wherever you are, outdoor learning is for you. Um, you just have to shift the focus a little bit. So this is just one piece of 9,000 pieces of research. So I work with Take Me Outside as well. And on their website, takemeoutside.ca, you can find an amazing bank of resources. So if you're a teacher, if you're trying to persuade your admin, perhaps, or persuade parents, or if you're a student and you want more time outside, you can go to takemeoutside.ca and find all of this research that you can use, scientifically peer-reviewed research to show that this is really important. And here's one quote, converging evidence strongly suggests that experience of nature, nature being anything outside, boost academic learning, personal development and environmental stewardship, which we need for the future. Um, and so this is from Do Experiences with Nature Promote Learning. Um, there are just enormous um, bodies of information, some cool infographics that you can just print off a poster and say, this is, we want to take our learning outside. And I'm hopefully going to show you a little bit how you can do that later on. Okay, so setting up, so maybe you're new to this and you don't go outside. Maybe you're a math teacher or a um, history teacher and, and you're like, I'm an indoor teacher. There's, there's not really the way that my, my learning goes outside. I'm here to dispute that. Um, this was a grade 11, excuse me, environmental science group. And we were going out here to talk about... Um, forests uh biodiversity and we were going to look um we went over one day to two different spots one is a managed woodlot this one um so the trees are being harvested and replanted and that 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 resource is being managed um they hope sustainably and then we went to a place where there's protected old growth forest down at valley bottom and looked at it and you know what do you think had more biodiversity, the ancient old growth forest at, at surface level, the ancient old growth forest, or um, a recently um, sort of within the last two years cut down open cut block of forest? Drum roll. Well, actually, we found far more species um, in the, the new cut block than we did in this established forest because the, the old forests have got to this sort of apex um, situation where it's only a few species uh, of plants, let's say, visible in our little one metre by one metre sample area. Um, it's reached this apex, so it, it has these just few key species that, that hold everything together. Um, whereas when you've cut trees down, it, competition, you know, 
nature just comes alive and starts doing all these things. Um, but we talked about how valuable those plants are or whether they will be allowed to live if they're in a managed wood plot for example deciduous trees are often sprayed with chemicals to kill them even though um there's an amazing piece of research by dr suzanne samard on on the fact that um trees have symbiotic relationships so whilst the trees may grow slightly slower the conifers that we want for wood products they grow slightly slower at first if they have this sort of competition with with these uh, deciduous trees the birch your older um that actually um over time they end up being more successful because they share nutrients they the deciduous trees store water for them they provide wind protection so they don't get blown down before they can grow um but anyway simple trip we can do lots of fun things um but here's what it looks like you might not be a person who's obsessed with science and trees like me so let's just say that you are uh, a teacher who loves your subject whatever that subject is um taking your learning outside and maybe this is just meeting your class outside after lunch or recess instead of joining them back in the classroom and spending 10 or 15 minutes um or maybe you start your day by setting the stage so with the grade levels we're at seven and above um we're at the point where we can do some really fun complex thoughts but i set the stage with like some sort of hook so it might be a newspaper article that i've printed out for the kids to read that's like super inflammatory and gets them feeling something or it might be um uh, like everybody loves a, a show and tell but it might be a bag with something random in it um like a bag full of um lard like animal fat that you can get that that we're going to talk about adaptations from um or it might be a pine comb if we're going to talk about fractal shapes and um fibonacci sequences in the way that math presents in nature um or it could be um a badge or some kind of historical object a coin um that doesn't seemingly have any re re relevance to what's going to happen next but to ask them why what is this what do you what is it look at it um and to just it's just something to set a stage and, and get them thinking and then you go outside um and if it's lovely weather, you can do the setting the stage outside, depends how nice your things are. Sometimes I have real furs that I have um, had hunters donate to me um, that are a really great way. If you're talking about physics, the way that, um, you know, fur traps air or all kinds of things. Um, then it's a sensory wake up. And this is especially at the sort of ages we're talking about is an opportunity to like, switch off so almost every kid I see is on their phone on technology on screens you know I do it too um we just gotta take a moment and so this also is amazing because whatever subject you're teaching now and pretty much every curriculum that's coming out priorities are linked to mental um and physical well-being okay so firstly whenever we go outside we're going for a walk there's absolutely no way that that is not helpful for your physical well-being but mentally okay 30 minutes in trees um they release a chemical uh, a phytochemical that actually lowers heart rates um you will lower cortisol the stress hormone in your body you will increase dopamine and serotonin um for those students who might have um any attention deficit disorders or just struggle to be in a formal quiet still classroom you remove those barriers noise doesn't uh, bounce off of forest or playground or fences chain fences uh, it dissipates whereas sound and rustling and fidgeting is very obvious in the classroom and noise is magnified bouncing off those hard surfaces outside you lose so much of that and so for me a sensory wake up and even at this age right I go to like home hardware and um your hardware store and get a bunch of those paint samplers like if you're going to paint your house they come on the long papers I cut them up I have a book like a bag and I could do this with kindergartners and they love it and I've done it with grade 12s and they love it and you give them a color and I'm like go find it don't pull anything living off of trees it's another way you can talk about responsible time outside in nature as well sometimes they get to an age and they've forgotten um 
to care for the environment around them. So don't pull off that bit of bark. But especially at this age, you can do really hard colors like neon colors or pinks and purples in winter. Like where are you going to find it? And then you might find a microscopic bit of pink within birch bark um, or maybe they come back with someone's jacket or whatever and you can talk about it. But anyway, sensory wake up. So that could be paint chips. It could be um, a 30 second using an app or a YouTube video breathing. Um, so you get them to stand, close their eyes and and breathe or um, ask them to feel the sensations of um, of touch of wind on their face. To listen, what can they hear? What's the furthest noise? What's the closest noise? Um, looking, opening their eyes, what's the closest thing they can see and what's the furthest? Without moving their head, what's the furthest thing left they can see and the furthest thing right? Stick their tongue out, can they taste anything? And so this is just a moment to just check in, to switch off from the busy, to give them a bit of mental space. And the research is here as well, that this is effectively therapy. Um, anytime that you have that piece and yeah, there's going to be kids who don't respond well, they fidget. And for those of you, if you're students watching who this doesn't sound like something you want to do. Okay. But maybe um, you are really into sports or maybe you're a gamer Um that you have situations that are high stress, high tension. Or maybe you're just going through life and the fact that, that school is hard, right? Emotions, relationships are hard. Relationships with your parents, your teachers, it's all hard. So skills that we can learn to end up responding rather than reacting to things is being able to breathe. It switches off the, the parasympathetic nervous system, the fight, flight, or freeze that stress and it allows you to go into a moment where you can make better choices these are skills that you can take with you um if you're having an argument with someone or if you are about to take a, a penalty shot in soccer um and you need to find that calm place if you're about to break your record on an online game um and you could potentially these days make money or whatever these are the opportunities. So sensory wake up, chilling out, connecting. Um, these don't also have to happen in this order. Normally setting the stage comes first, the hook. Um, but any of the following ones can happen at any time. Maybe you combine your sensory wake up and your sit spot. And this is just going somewhere and chilling out. And, you know, grade sevens and up, you could sit for a couple of minutes. And you can give them a pose like, hmm. I wonder, you know, what do you notice on the ground around you? So they're actually looking or have them close their eyes uh, and ask them um, if you had to think of one word to describe what you're feeling in your body at the moment after your two minutes sit, do it. And you don't have to get kids to share their answers, right? If some of it's a bit more personal, you don't have to do that. It can just be, it's just that moment of, of contemplation and reflection. Um, and it's, it's, it's meditation and it's calming and it's also a connection to the space around them. Um, outdoor lessons, some sort of exploration investigation. If you're doing math, like where do you find angles in nature? Um, if you're doing history, um, where was this place? Can you find evidence of this place being changed? What do you think was here before the buildings were? Go out, draw it, have a think about it. Um, can we take standard metadata? Can we take the temp air temperature? Thermometers are super cheap. Um, record the sky cover. What is it? Cloudy or overcast? Bright sunshine. Um, can we draw plants and animals? Can we take photographs? We've got, and if you, you know, technology is not exclusive from the outdoors, especially at these age groups. And they're experts, right? You guys are experts if you're listening. So um, iNaturalists use apps or take photographs to then go back and sketch inside or to go and then do research on. Find me something interesting. Take a picture of it. That can then spark an entire lesson on what is interesting was it the texture of it was it the idea of it was it where it was what is it that you you find interesting and some sort of game 
right? Everybody likes to run about. I've played like a, a game called Catch a Wave with these guys in the forest where you basically all go and hide except one person. It starts off with me. I wander through the forest. And then if I see someone hiding, I um I say their name or point to them and they have to join me in a snake trail walking through this this landscape. Um, if you're in a playground, doesn't quite work as well. You need a bit of, of hiding. So I'll give you a game in a minute. Um, and then, um, however, the people behind me have to stay with me unless they can catch a wave. So if they spot people hiding before I do, and the person hiding can see them and gives them a little wave, they can melt back into hiding. And it, this was just an amazing game for them to start paying attention and they got really into it. If you are um, on a playground scenario, different colored um, pipe cleaners, blue ones for water, green ones for food, brown ones for shelter, right? We're talking about the, the things that uh, make up a habitat and you have bases four bases and they have like two minutes uh to go and get they're in teams every member of their team in order to survive the winter for example needs three food three water three shelter so you give them two minutes they have to run to a central location where all of those things are and go back then you start adding variables like predators around guarding the food and water and shelter and then we can start to talk about human habitation destruction and so I start taking shelter away because we've destroyed the forest habitat where they would be uh, then we have a water shortage because climate change and so I start taking it and then we talk about some of the things we can do to ameliorate that so actually we put in new bylaws and people start using their water responsibly and all oh, right the water goes back up into the reservoirs for nature um we can talk about greening our school grounds or greening um, environments and making sure we plant trees. Okay, more habitat, then that's fine, uh, which therefore creates more food. So some sort of game, some sort of thing, and I can link to these in the worksheet um, to keep them moving. I would actually recommend you do sensory wake up, then game, get a bit of the energy out, then an exploration, and then a sit spot where you could sort of ruminate on what you've what you've done in your investigation. And then a full reflection extension is you, you take it back into the classroom or you do a gratitude circle, one thing that you were grateful for this time outside. I can guarantee you'd be so surprised if you're not doing a gratitude practice, how once you've done it a few times and the vulnerability is okay, um, how meaningful and thoughtful and sh and and uplifting those uh, exercises can be but taking it back all right maybe we went outside and on one stick you get kids who are doing math like i need you to find an obtuse a right angle an acute angle all on one stick right all of the angles of the sticks joining on and then we go back out and we do an investigation, a full investigation into various shapes and architecture and why buildings or modern buildings are built the way they are. What's the perfect uh, angle for a roof so that snow falls off if you live somewhere snowy? There's just so much opportunity then to take that learning back inside. Um, all of this has the potential if we're looking at plants and animals it can be a language lesson it can be a literacy you can be a writing exercise journaling um you can utilize it to um teach concepts like estimation or, or or you know fun games could literally be like piles of of leaves how many leaves are in that pile how did you work it out um, maybe you're looking at history and you're thinking about this place and then you go back and research about who used to live here and how that worked. Um, there's just so many opportunities, or if you're taking photographs and you can build a, you know, we've built amazing field manuals or um, sort of local field guides about a place, about the plants and animals, about its its the culture here, um, that, that really can have students really sort of engaging and feeling um, super honored. Let's check how we're doing for time. Mm. okay teachers one of the books i highly recommend is a walking curriculum it's by dr Gillian judson she's a professor of education uh it's all about developing a sense of place right when we know a place we care about it and so that's very individual to where you are um it also has things for like checkup set 
checklists for set up for sharing with parents about field trips or the work you're going to do for sharing with admin about why it's important. Um, it's about preparation to maximize success and then how to debrief, like how to properly make this learning. So I'm going to ask you for a second, maybe you can pause this because I don't have time to do that because I over prepare always. Um, but I'd love everyone who's ever's watching this teachers or students to say um, these walking curriculum and these short walks are a paragraph talking about things um, some of them are like a people walk so you're looking around what other people are there if you're especially if you're in an urban environment are they walking um, or standing still how are they moving are they on foot or in different um, other modes of transport so and you can make it as complex as you want, but they have a lovely and unlovely walk. And I just want you to sit for a minute. And this could be a sit spot question and think one natural place you would hate to see paved over. Like if tomorrow it became the next Walmart parking lot, that it would be really heart wrenching for you. Describe this place to me in three to five sentences. And if for some reason you don't have a natural place that's important to you, let's think about a place that you would like to go and why or why is that not accessible for you what what is missing um you know what barriers exist to to natural places being a part of your lives but this is something I'd love you to do describe it in three to five sentences and then if you feel comfortable you can share with each other but I've done this live with people and you know the emotion that's connected to place is is huge and all humans need a sense of belonging and we belong uh, when we're with nature because we are nature. We're not separate from it. The iron in our blood is the same iron that runs in rocks and came out of a massive star explosion billions of years ago. It's all the same. The water you drink out of the tap is the same water that dinosaurs were sipping out of puddles 66 million years ago. It's all, we are all one. It's all cycled. It's all connected. And so even the simplest thing about talking about somewhere you like can tie into that. And it's, it's extremely powerful. Some simple tips if you're out doing things. Um, celebrate individual wins. Some people are not comfortable outside. They're not comfortable getting wet, especially um, if students are wearing like their nice clothes, despite the fact you've been like we're going outside and they're wearing their nice sneakers. If maybe it's just until they get the idea that you're actually going to go out and please go out often and go out all the time, whatever the weather, um, even if it's just the edge of the schoolyard, have a look, take 10 deep breaths and go back in. Great. Celebrate those wins. Um, if it's wet, you, this can be a fun thing to find show. I was supposed to be rock climbing with these kids. So obviously that was a, an adventurous day, but it was absolutely hammering rain. So what we did was I had a black bag in my back pouch I always do for garbage or anything and we just went to try and find dry wood to start a fire and and that took two hours was just finding dry things what shapes protect things what is an ideal place um and and that was a really interesting exercise oh um use your bodies as boundaries I'm here um I'm the same height as the kids don't laugh um and I, we are up on a really big cliff above uh, the Jordan River here. And so I'm just using my body. I'm using my body. If you're fighting about risk management, um, you'd be surprised at the self-preservation actually instincts of youth. Um, but you can use your body. But you should always know where you are. If you're going anywhere more exciting, like, I mean, exciting, I mean, uh, unknown, <laughs> let's say, um, have a paper map and a compass as a backup for technology or have a dedicated GPS and your phone uh, as opposed to using like, you know, Google Maps or a Gaia app or something. Um, and this could be it. If this is not an option for you, have your students map their schoolyard, have them map the area around your school and then make awesome clues to lead people on a treasure hunt that they get to a final place uh, and there's there's they, they get to achieve the final prize um you can utilize gps um to do that or you can have them start doing you know measuring steps or using landforms they can write silly ditties or code in order to have um this work and that can be a really amazing way so uh Part of mapping and being excited doesn't have to be far removed. 
Um, if you've got adults coming, parents, helpers, they need instruction as well. Um, if you're outdoors, they just tend to like not function well um okay some of my students here have older youth devise the plan right ownership in small decisions where do you want to go again use your id um apps or use technology to take photos um and have them read the instructions to each other so that they have a sense of ownership of what they're doing one of the big things I love to do outdoors, and this works on any trail or in a circle around your yard, uh, school yard, is to have young people teach. So it's called rotational interpretation. So everyone's split into groups and um, you leave them over here with like a simple like I spy type scenario where they have to find something around them from A to Z, right, while they're waiting. Um, the first group goes along and you teach them or they've got you teach them three three bullet points right there's maybe three or four students in a, each group and whatever you're trying to teach them it could be notes about whatever subject you're on or the environment around them you're going to teach them those four things and then you're going to send group two from the main group they come all the way to group one and group one teach them um what you had shared with them and then group two continue on a bit of a way and stop and you teach them a few things and then the next group comes to the main group they learn from group one they learn from group two then they become group three and get their instructions and eventually all groups go the last group comes to group one learns picks up their knowledge um and then they take group one with them because there's nobody left to learn then they take uh you go to group two you pick them up Anyway, I can draw a diagram. It makes a bit more sense when you're actually physically doing it. But then every student is teaching. I like to do a cool thing on biomimicry where we do some research about animals and things like uh, all of the new um, professional swimsuits that they use in the Olympics um, have a material that is um, mimic shark skin because it creates anti-drag um, or the fact that new climbing shoes and um, running shoes are based on like goat hoof technology um because they have such incredible grip um the, the lists are endless and you can find this research online there's an amazing bbc podcast at the british broadcasting company um called 30 animals that make us smarter um and that's all biomimicry stuff you can have them listen to the podcast in their headphones right trust them and then get them to make key points and then teach it to the rest of their class it's awesome um Take some stuff, laminate it. We're out here. This is, we're learning about climate change is that's my special subject. But um, these are greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere that um, retain heat and warm our atmospheres, the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a natural thing that happens. It basically keeps our planet really lovely, warm and habitable, right? Since, you know, millions of years ago. Um, Without it, the average temperature on Earth would be minus 18 Celsius. So it, it's pretty miserable most of the time. Um, and so, but we're pumping more of these um, gases into the atmosphere and it's, in, it's increasing that ability of the atmosphere to hold heat. And then that's causing all kinds of things, floods, droughts, um, increased extreme weather events, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so here I, what I had here is had them line up in the amount of order that they think of the amount of smallest to largest of that gases in the atmosphere. And then I had them redo it based on what they think has the most impact because some of these uh, gases have longer um, half life so they stay up there longer. And some of them we have most carbon dioxide, but actually it's it's not as um, negative as, as ozone, for example, but there's not as much of that in the atmosphere. So um, anyway, doing lessons outside where if you just get them to physically plan things or even have them go outside and do um, uh, sort of decision-making things where you ask them, uh, um, do you think it's this or that? And have them go and move their bodies and show you. That's another way that you can um, take quizzes outside, right? Or or, or shift that, um, that thinking from, you know, read this and then answer the questions. You can do silly stuff like these are, um, Things I made with some grade seven students. These are um, waste free Christmas gifts, right? So this is like a cultural thing. It's a social thing. 
gift cards, um, ski passes, um, things to go out. You can do stuff that's that's linked to the outdoors inside, right? Or talks about sustainability. Anytime we talk about climate or sustainability, I, I branch that under outdoor learning. We actually put them up in a local cafe on the window and it was amazing. Um, movie days, talking about sustainability or the outdoors as a hook. This has worked really well. Popcorn always goes down a treat and then you use that hook to get them to devise their own investigations or connections. Food, cooking, if, if you can cook with your students. My God, firstly, knife skills, great skills. Uh, also tidying up. Uh, is a huge part and very excellent. We went to the grocery store, if you can do that for a field trip, and looked at where the fruit and veg came from. We're lucky um, where we are. There's quite a long growing season and um, year round we can get um, BC grown veg. Um, but if you can't, why not? Or where's the furthest, farthest thing that you can find on the ingredients list? Um, and then getting your kids to cook, right? We did like a three course meal. And the parents were blown away at their skills, um, at their capacity for, um, firstly, to create something, to follow it through. We made pastry, we did all these things, but it's not just cooking. It's an opportunity to talk about transport. Where do things come from? Emissions. Um, what is our relationship to food? How has that changed? What indigenous foods do we not have anymore? Or what would they eat? Um, if we hadn't have um, taken away that culture and force fed the Mars, like there's just so many ways that you can tie into it. Um, the physics of cutting and what shapes that can you create? Like, you know, does uh, do an experiment? Does everything have the same temperature if you put it, if the veggies cut all the same size or if not? And you can do that with thermometers. It's it's pretty cool. Um, I did a fun thing. These are my grade seven kids. They create this whole video. We went to a local thing, uh, to a local green space and um, did some invasive species work. We were supported by this, our local invasive species society. So building relationships with other groups. We walked down to the green belt with the determination of defeating some invasive plants. Recently, that area has been taken over by many invasive plants, but we had our eye on three in particular. Suspect number one, blueweed. Though it's a nice looking flower in the spring and summer, this invasive plant has been popping up over the past years and making it harder for other plants to grow. Okay, so we went out and did this. Not only with science and we're learning about um, invasive species for sustainability, like invasive species um, out maneuver our native species, pollinators have like a lock and key native pollinators can only pollinate native plants and so um you know one out of every three bites of food comes from pollinated plants so if we lose that then we're in trouble so these kids uh they wrote these scripts after we talked about what we did and i was like okay we need an introduction we can describe the methodology. Um, if we scooch, um, there's all kinds of images. They were talking about the methodology. There was a puppet show. Um, there was a rap at the end. I wish I had time to show you it all. But so we're doing literacy. We're doing uh, drama. We're doing expression of self. We're doing presenting to a team. I, I have a GoPro camera. You can get them cheap online, but you can also nowadays just use an iPhone like the quality is exceptional right so all of this have the students if they're a bit older as well uh, we this is water testing um i had them film our field trip going out and doing water quality testing and then i got them to narrate um this is them doing field sketches about the area we did biological tests on animals uh we did macro invertebrate studies which literally all you need is is a net and some ice cube trays i have you know these petri dishes and stuff and a simple id key which you can get online or in field guides um and then i had the kids i do have a fancy microphone but um and there are some grants you can use learning for sustainable future has a 500 dollar action grant so if you built that into your project um or you know there's so many available for technology then these students recorded they were so against this they did not want to record uh their things um and as the older students get they don't want to be on video but 
this was their chance to express themselves. However you want to communicate it, I want you to narrate your video and tell me what we did. And it was such a roaring success. We've also made big posters and it's my dog um, hanging out. Uh, this hangs out at the busiest intersection of our city. Um, you, This is all about water, shorts, uh, water scarcity, following bylaws, fat in the pan goes in the can rather than flushing fat because we went on a tour uh, so you could go on a tour of your local water plant a lot of municipalities will do that and they were really um impressed and they wanted to show that that they cared and this was a beautiful image of salmon uh, it's not the best photograph i apologize we had students we got an lsf uh grant and then we talked to our local city we were so upset by how many people were idling outside the school and so these students made their own idle free um signs the city gave them a template the whole school voted uh and these were the winners and so you can do a bunch of stuff that's like uplifting legacy for your community uh, right outside your schoolyard that can be a really amazing thing I'm really into tools and resources I obviously I work with a store we're a charitable non-profit um, so everything we do goes back into sort of um, supporting you for outdoor learning um, but field guides are amazing and can be used for literacy and language skills as well um, bird watching having a sit pad especially with kids who've got nice clothes who don't want to sit somewhere these sit pads are cheap and uh, keep their butt dry um if you're looking for a hook um books like connecting the dots or people's curriculum for the earth or groundswell have these amazing short essays that you can use um not extinct this is about the Sinites, um, but we have a lot of books in the store that are from Strong Nations, which is an indigenous owned and operated publishing house, which covers coast to coast on Total Island. And you can read a story that's local to you and then and integrate that into your teaching. Do water quality testing. You don't have to be a scientist to do it. There's the simplest handbook in there which teaches you how to do it. If it's midwinter and you have the opportunity um, either before school or after school, to look at the sky uh, and talk about it or maybe it's because you don't see the sky very often do you suffer from light pollution where you are what impact does that have on nature how could you do something about that within your local community or within your school space well I guess you can't have any questions here in this moment but um I will have my email at the bottom of the worksheet. And so if you do have any questions or um, comments or things that you would like support within outdoor learning, getting you outside for learning is my uh, greatest passion and means the most to me. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry, I tend to dive right in. and I'm so passionate about this subject because um, we are nature and, and we are suffering from this deficit disorder where we're not connected. And so, um, First people's principles of learning as well is like you don't have to have indigenous groups come and, and do specialist things just by being outside, by paying attention, uh, by learning about your place, then you are doing work for, towards that. And also there's just an opportunity for mental, social, emotional well-being and to tick off um, assessments, whatever you're doing as part of your curriculum, um, just in short snippets outside, which is just great for everyone. So thank you so much for listening.